everyone. Welcome to Build. I'm Simon Atkins. As always, we are live from London. Now, today I'm joined by the director and cast of British gangster film that follows the epic rise and legendary fall of one of the most notorious criminal empires London has ever known. From Once Upon a Time in London, please give it up for Terry Stone, Nadia Ford and director Simon Rumley. <laughs> Hi guys. Hello. Hello. Welcome to Build. Thank you for We're having us. We're excited to have you guys here. Before we get started, if you guys at home want to get involved and ask the guys a question, you can tweet them at Build Series LDN or leave a comment below this video if you're watching live on Facebook. Guys, welcome to Build. Thank you. So, Once Upon a Time in London is upon us. It's going to be out on the 19th of April. Um, Once Upon a Time, the title would suggest that it's a kind of a fairy tale like uh, movie, but it's anything but that. Um, Simon, can you kind of just set up what the storyline is um, about? Certainly. Well, it's about these two gangsters. Um, one's called Jack Spot Comer, and the other is called Billy Hill, and they're real life gangsters. And, and as we, we've kind of been telling everyone, they're, they're the missing link between Peaky Blinders and, and, and the craze. Because they, Jack Spot Comer was a kind of East End thug who, who bit by bit came to prominence um, in the London underworld, and and it's very much about his rise. But then he, he brought on uh, on board a guy called Billy Hill as as a kind of left hand man, and uh, they 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 started getting on admirably at the beginning, but bit by bit things didn't go according to plan, and then Billy Hill became his adversary. Um, so it's kind of like the rise and fall and rise kind of thing about two real life gangsters. And it's set in the 1930s in um, in East London. Fashion was on the rise. There's loads of kind of like, you know, gang war and, and violence. What is it like and how do you go about depicting that that time well, it's actually pretty tricky because we it starts it starts in 1936, just before the Cable Street riots, um, with with Jack Spot uh, rousing some well the, the the local inhabitants to walk against um, Mosley and his black shirts and fascists. Um, but then we go through through the, the f uh, Second World War, all all the forties, and then it finishes in about 19 I think 54 when you know Frankie Fraser's in in the film a little bit. He's obviously a, a very well known. Kind of gangster face and, and and the craze and it's it's just as 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 these you know these guys getting to point that they realise that they are no longer the, the, the kind of the crazy young men who are, who are um, doing new things to um, to to the old school they, they you know that they're being yeah ousted really um, so in terms of you know we we try to film on location pretty much everywhere and actually we, we succeeded it wasn't easy to be honest um, but there are and I think if you if we waited another ten years it'll probably be impossible but you know. We, we rewrote some of the script and put it in pubs and, and, and clubs, which is where, of course, a lot of them would hang out um, on, on an evening um, at illegal gambling dens. And, and yeah, you know, it's, it's a lot of location scouting and, and uh, making sure that, that the period detail was right and that, you know, even if, when we went to pubs, that, that there weren't, um, you know, the, the, the wrong, um, you know, uh, draft handles yeah. and that kind of stuff. Well, it's a great watch, and it's um, you. it, there's you know it's extremely gruesome, which we'll talk about in a second. But Terry, you play um, Jack Spock Comer, who is one of the most notorious gangsters, British gangsters. What kind of person was he like? Um, and what was it like playing? He, that role? he, he was a lover, not a fighter. But um, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Um, <laughs> that, do, do you know what? It, it's interesting because um, I think he actually thought he was doing the right thing, and he thought. I think it's just a, a typical case of somebody just getting carried away. You know, they, um, they, he come from nothing, you know, penniless immigrant. He was the butt of all the Jew jokes, you know. He, he, he went through his whole life being terrorised and traumatised and being attacked. And, you know, I just think that he become a product of his environment. He saw an opportunity, he seized it, and then he thought he was a genius and uh, that everybody should bow down to him. And, and, and you know, he got carried away and um, lost it all. Um, and died a penniless greengrocer with no wife, no kids. So I think, you know, when you actually watch Don't the story... Away. I, I, I thought that's... <laughs> oh, sorry, sorry. OK, well, you know what happens at the end now, but... <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's, it, it's, it's, a, it's a piece of time in history. All you need to do is yeah. Google it. Um, but so, Nadia, you play his wife, Rita. I do. So what kind of uh, person was she? Well... Initially, when I got the script and when I auditioned for it, I, I had never heard of Rita before. But actually, when you Google, there's so much. Cause, because all of the court cases, everything, it's all real and true. So 
it was really kind of a, really good for me to be able to go and pick from these stories because yeah. she was you know Jack and Rita were kind of written about a lot you know um, by the press back then um, so there was all these articles and stuff there was a, a book that I read so um, yeah it was being from from Dublin and she grew up in Townsend mm. Street and that's you know a short drive from where I grew up so it was actually I kind of came from a place of really relating to where she came from but the whole world that she was thrust into marrying Jack was something that I had to kind of go with it at the, you know, from, from what I saw online. We, we were the posh and becks of Whitechapel, weren't we? <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> so yeah. what was their relationship like then, Jack and, and Rita? Well, I, you know, I think, um, I think, I, I, mean, I mean, you know, Jack wanted to settle down. And um, when he met Rita, obviously he realised that she was the woman for him. And, um, and I think there was, you know, it's that thing where, you probably would have seen this together and said, what is she seeing him? <laughs> no, I... um, but it's that thing where only we know. And um, I, so I think, I think that's part of it. And I think she saw me as a project. She wanted to change me. And she thought, she saw the good in me. That's what I think. And but the charisma. No, 100%. I think when Rita comes into the story, there is a new moral compass that's introduced to the film because there's just so much blood and guts yeah. and gore and I feel like she kind of brings back the uh, tries it just is trying to bring out the good in people really I think and this is your feature film debut yeah it is um congratulations Thank on you that so uh, much. you're great in it um how did the role come about for you I actually auditioned for for a different film that Terry was producing um and um yeah and he and didn't didn't get the role and then a couple of months later he said, I think I have a role that Nadia would be good for. Can I get a tape? And I, and I was actually on, um, I was actually doing a tour at the time, right. stage show. And I remember just taping uh, with a friend. And then, yeah, he just, yeah, that was it. It was, ama it was, do you know what? It's so amazing for, you know, to sit with these two guys and men and, and, and have chats about so something that they're so passionate about and creative. And for them to trust me with it was just I was delighted, so yeah, I loved it. And Simon, of course, you've done a fantastic job directing this movie. Um, how did that come about? Well, um, okay, again, you know, friends of friends, uh, someone that Terry and Richard, the other producer, knew, um, recommended me. He'd seen a fair few of my previous films, and, and I think my most recent film, Crowhurst, and said, hey, you know, th th um, these guys are looking for a director. Y you may not want to do it, and, and tell me what it's about. And I said, actually, no, I'd love to do it. Uh, and you know, I've, I, I guess like any film enthusiast, you know, I've grown up watching gangster films, especially American gangster films, and and um, and you know, there was that kind of heyday of British gangster films, I guess, in in, in the kind of late 60s, 70s. And um, yeah, so I, I, I thought it was a great opportunity, so um, I, I jumped at it really. Um, this is obviously a real life story, but am I right in saying that um, it, the, the idea of putting this on screen came from uh, you, Terry? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> um, I grew up, as, as, as Simon said, you know, being consumed by gangster films from The Godfather, Goodfellas, yeah. Casino, all the, all the great movies. And, um, um, you know, the, the Peaky Blinders obviously came out, The Craze came out. I mean, The Craze are probably the most famous gangsters other than the Essex boys in, in yeah. England. They're and crazier um, like circa 1950, aren't they? They, well, the fifth, it was, they were really the gangsters of the 60s. They yeah. were, in the 50s, they, they become of age, but in the 60s when they become the, the guys in the suits with the glasses with Barbara Windsor and yeah. all the celebrities, and they become the first sort of celebrity gangsters. And then obviously the Essex boys later on become famous because of the, the notorious slaying in the, in the Range Rover. But... Um, what's interesting for me is everything in this film is true. And when you look at a lot of gangster films, even the ones that are allegedly based on true stories, mm. they're 80% they're fiction, right? And, 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 and with this, it's all facts. It's all true. It's all in the public domain. People can check it up. You know, there, there might be some things that we change where people, when they're getting tortured, may not have uh, been tortured in that way. But we're going, to talk, about it. We're going to talk about <laughs> some of those torture scenes because they are absolutely gruesome. But first, we want to look at the trailer. Yeah, perfect. Once upon a time in London. Um, a great trailer. Um, so, did you ever know Jack Comer, or did you guys how like how did you do your research? Um, well, I, I I never met him, but um, I'm related to him, and um, you know it, it came through years of being told about this mythical 
underworld character called Jack Spock Homer. And um, I think, you know, everybody knows about the craze. Everybody, you know, now knows about Peaky Blinders. But nobody really ever talks about... Even though there's been books on uh, Mad Frankie Fraser, there's been books on the Sabinis, there's been books on um, Jack Spock Homer, there's been books on Billy... All these people have had books about them, but for some reason, nobody's ever sort of gone, oh, I'd love to see a film mm. about that. <clears throat> so, 2010... Um, I, I developed a screenplay with some writers I've worked previously. And um, and then when I started talking to people, everyone was going, I'm not sure if it'll work, it's period, you know, period crime films, they're not really on vogue, you know. Why don't you make Rise of the Foot Soldier 25 or Essex Boys 23, you know. <laughs> that was all people wanted to watch, right? <laughs> so, um, so we were sort of like, we don't really want to do that. Um, so I just thought, you know what, I'll just put it on a shelf yeah. and then come back to it. <clears throat> and then what happened was... Um, um, obviously, Broadwalk Empire came on, period crime TV show. Peaky Blinders come on, period crime TV show. All of a sudden, you hear Suddenly Tom Hardy's going to play yeah. Ronnie and Reggie again. And I thought, maybe it's time to get this going. And, um, you know, we, we, we met Simon and, and we had a good chat. And uh, Simon was like, you know, I like this and, and wanted to do a draft and, you know, make, make the women stronger characters. Right. Because in a lot of these gangster films, the women are either portrayed as Irving Dawes or just some some bird, you know. Um, and, and he said, actually, they were strong characters because it, with the backdrop of the war, all the guys were away fighting and the women had to look after the families and that to earn the money. And so they were strong characters and um, we wanted to celebrate that. So with the actual film, having the strong male and strong female characters working together, yeah, was, was it, that was obviously, you know, Simon's, Simon's idea yeah. and, and Simon... Put, put that into the screenplay, and yeah, you know, we ended up getting three fantastic actresses: Nadia, Kate Braithwaite, and um, Holly Earl, who played the ladies, the leading ladies, and they all done a fantastic job. It works. They 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 all work really well, actually. And and as you said, you, your character in it is such a strong uh, character. What was it like uh, playing her when she was uh, pregnant at one point in the oh. film? <laughs> <laughs> I got, I actually loved the pregnancy suit. Um, I did, <laughs> so much so, I actually had a real baby after we were wrapped, but um, no, <laughs> no, I, um, I, I loved it. And I also, I think automatically, you know, I wasn't a mother at the time that we filmed this. I, I putting it on, you phys physically, become pregnant you know you're yeah. it's, it's a weight you're you know i would i would wouldn't i sit there at the trailer and, and rub the belly Ooh, and they'd kicking. be like are you okay Ooh, nadia and i'd be like there rubbing my <laughs> rubbing my belly but i think with each female lead in this particular film they come in and they change something about the narrative and that's for especially now now at the moment like you know yes there is two the story is about billy hill and it is about jack spot but the the women really do shape these men and that's and that's not lost in it which i think is really important um no gangster movie is complete without um jamie foreman playing mr white <laughs> did you know that you wanted him from the offset simon well, um, I have to say no, um, but again, you know, Terry, Terry and I spoke, I think, um, about, you know, a lot of cast members and uh, uh, Terry knew a lot of them. And, and obviously, you know, he comes with his own history and, and his own presence. And, and I think Terry spoke to him and we thought, well, you know, wh why, we, why wouldn't we want Jamie in, in a film? And he was, he was a you know, lovely person, very professional, you know, did, did what he had to do and left and he was great, great. I, I think one of the um, things with this film which we did try and achieve, when we started casting, we actually said, let's actually make a gangster film with people that aren't necessarily known yeah. for being in gangster films. And w we managed to cast some people like that. But then when we actually started talking to distributors, they all said, look, you know, if this is going to be the gangster film of all gangster films, which is their intention, then why don't you put in the people that have been in the best gangster films in the last 20 years? And Jamie Foreman's been in Layer Cake, he's been in Neil by Mouth, he's been in some amazing movies. You know, a lot of people say, oh, he's the guy from EastEnders, but he's been in some amazing films. And, um, you know, as a massive pedigree, Jeff Bell, another fantastic, fantastic British actor. Yeah. Um, you know, Roland Mnookin again. But these people have been in some of the best British crime films in the last sort of 10, 20 years. So to actually get them to be in this film playing these it's parts. It's huge. And um, with people like Holly Earl, who you wouldn't necessarily put in this film, yeah. or Nadia, is great because then you get this mixture of, uh, you know, we got a couple of um, uh, boxing champions in this movie as well. I don't know if you saw them. Um, but, you know, th and they can all act, but they're real tough guys. So when you see them on screen, you don't go, 
he's pretending to be tough. You know, he really <laughs> is. <laughs> um, no gangster movie is complete without a bit of violence. And um, this film is Certificate 18, and for, you know, good reason. Some of the scenes are so gory. Like, there's one scene, um, Simon, where um, you're, you're using a guy as a human dartboard. Mm. That is... Very gory. What was that like to direct, and what what are those scenes like? Well, um, you know, it, it was. I, I I've always believed that violence is is good if you see it once or twice, but it has to be make its own mark rather than seeing lots of lots of violence and at some point you just get kind of anesthetized to it. So um, so this is something I've actually wanted to do for a long time, and and actually came from the David Bowie song uh, Station to Station, and and I think the line is throwing darts in lovers' eyes. And it was actually written about Alistair Crowley and, and one of his um, magic um, kind of cult, um, I don't know, uh, rituals. And, and, and I, that always stuck with me in thinking, because I, I come from a kind of psychological horror background. Right. Um, where, again, I, you know, there's usually like a piece of violence, but it's literally like one, one, one or two pieces. But everyone thinks, well, I was really violent. But actually, it's just that the violence seems so... Um, kind of real and believable and and, and uh, I guess rem memorable or oh, mem uh, memorable and hard um, to watch some yes. of them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> not not the characters they're loving it you know in yeah. that particular scene that's what I can't get over they're enjoying Especially every single when moment. Especially everyone in the background is going one hundred and eighty. <laughs> but but is it is it um you know is it hearsay? Are you reimagining the violence, or are you getting um is you know are some of those scenes are they from from stuff that actually happened? Well, well the, the the V slash was very much uh, a mark of Billy Hills. Um, and and I th they, they used to do that as, as just a kind of insignia of that he's, he'd, he'd been there, kind of like like marking his territory. Um, and the other thing was, you know, there was a lot of there was a lot of fights, literally fisticuffs and slashings, because back then there was um, capital punishment. So so basically, it's not like now if, if you killed someone, you, you may go to jail, uh, albeit for a long time. Then if you killed someone and you were found guilty, you would be, you would be hung. So, so basically, they were all very happy to go around smashing each other to, to pieces. But, but nonetheless, they would still stop short of, of killing a man. So, so that's why there was a lot of you know, punching and slashing, but that's about it. Which is why also when you see Frankie Fraser you know, come in with a gun, that, that is very much a, a, a visual indication of, okay. of actually the next step in, in gangster, gangster landry. Because, because at, talking about Frankie Fraser as well, um, he spent nearly all of his adult life in jail. And he, would, he, he just had no cut off. You know, he would quite happily torture someone, stab someone, He's in jail. You upset him, he stabs you because yeah. he's there anyway. Um, and and you know that was his life. And the thing is, I think that's what ha that's also towards the end of the film is how how it's changing. And I think people then you know like Billy sort of realizes yeah. you know maybe it's time to let the craze do their thing. And then obviously they did their thing. And then the Richards just did their thing. And then somebody else coming and did their thing. But with crime, wherever you are in the world, it just keeps evolving. It keeps going on to the next guy, the next girl, the next you know it just keeps going. So. Um, one more thing we have to mention before we finish up is the soundtrack, because I mean, amidst a lot of those violent scenes, is this upbeat music? How is how does that um, how is that decided upon? Because I, that, I think I think it was, was great script. actually. That was in the because I I noticed that was one of the first things I noticed when I originally read like my first reading of the script was. I think you had Doris Day in there or something yeah, like that, yeah, didn't you? Yeah, yeah. And I was like, what? Yeah. Like, <laughs> like, what is this? Um, yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, that very much came from me. Um, and it was the idea that, again, you know, I think violence can become uh, anesthetizing. And, and I wanted to get across the fact that, um, you know, it, it, I, I didn't want to do just another, you know, violent British gangster film. So, but uh, it, we, we couldn't make the film without the violence. So it was, it was really a way of counterpointing it and, and offering something different that, you know, hasn't necessarily been, been seen, at least in British gangster films. So um, trying to, you know, take the songs of, of the time and, 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 yeah, you know, put them to violence it just made, made it, some, for me, something fairly visually interesting. Yeah, I mean, it's, it probably sounded in the script like, it, you know, it wouldn't work, but it works really, really well. Um, guys, the uh, the movie is absolutely brilliant. Unfortunately, that's all we've got time for. But thank you so much for being on. Thanks, Thanks for having me. Thank, thank you very much. Um, Once Upon a Time in London is in cinemas from the 19th of April, so make sure you catch it. It's absolutely excellent. We'll be back at 5.30 with the hottest chef on the planet, Isaac Carew, so do join us then. But one more time, please give it up for Terry, Nadia and Simon. Yeah.